Good morning, everyone. Well, we're off and running again on another Friday, and uh, we have an excellent program for you today, and a lot of good information, a new look at uh, how we look at our water supply situation. But before I start, I'd like to ask uh, Bob Noonan of Orcharddale Water District to lead us in the pledge. America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any uh, any introductions uh, this morning? Someone that's uh, new to the group or hasn't been here for a while? Okay, we've got the veterans here today. Any uh, representatives from our elected officials that might be here today? Okay, maybe they're all at the Urban uh, Water uh, Conference uh, this week, so. Uh, pr probably the key activity, uh, certainly the water supply situation that we're dealing with, and, and probably the most uh, critical element is actions at the Metropolitan Water District on how much water we're going to have this summer. So, Brett Barbary, uh, would you like to update us on the MWD activities? Thank you very much. I'm not Linda Ackerman, just in case you were uh, curious. I'm um, not sure where Linda is today. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Larry Dick's not here. Linda's not here, so Larry McKinney's not here. So what does that mean? I'm, I'm the ultimate pinch hitter. But uh, up at Metropolitan, um, probably the biggest issue that everyone in the water business is um, concerned about is uh, allocation and how much water we're going to have. And I can't tell you where we're going to end up. There are a lot of pieces to the equation that need to be plugged in. Uh, the first is the tolerance level of the amount of water the Met Board feels comfortable pulling out of storage. We have roughly 1.2 million acre feet of usable storage uh, that we can draw on this year. So that's going to be a component whatever figure we end up with. What the state water allocation is going to be and it was just bumped up to 20. Uh, we're expecting that it may end up 25 to 30. And then based on that, what is our projected usage? And then that'll become our allocation. So uh, that'll be hotly, the issue of how much water we take out of storage, uh, I expect will be hotly debated next week up at Met. And then look for a uh, decision at our April board meeting. Um, snowpack is not great throughout the state. You all have seen the reports. Uh, we're hoping to import some of the snow from the East Coast. My brother in Boston said he'd be more than happy to ship some to us. Um, so, Other than that, on the Met agenda, uh, you, you'll notice one of the biggest components is our R&R and our updates uh, to the Colorado River Aqueduct. We spend a tremendous amount of money keeping that 70-year-old facility in pristine condition. Those of you that have been on the trips, you've seen how well maintained our facilities are. And that's because we are very, very religious in how much money we spend and, and uh, continuously provide that. Uh, you juxtapose that with the state water project and you know, we, we don't really need to go there. Uh, the, the final piece is uh, at the board we'll be authorizing the, the final components of uh, the half a billion dollars that we've invested up at the Deemer plant uh, to get the ozonation up and running to do the, the final uh, landscaping. Uh, as you know, that area is, is prone to fires, and so we um, have new regulations that we have to comply with, so we'll be uh, finalizing that this month. So any of you have any questions? And how many of you knew that in February we had a complete shutdown of the Colorado River Aqueduct? Did any of you notice that? You didn't, so that's how well maintained, and that's how well the MET system plans. Uh, these things, and that's how well we work with MODOC. So thank you very much. Well, we'll s see if we have uh, any any great news on the uh, aqua front. Uh, Pierre Swan. <clears throat> I'm causing the chairman to, in your cardiac arrest by coming in about five minutes late, and he's out in the corridor trying to find someone else to give this report, and he's panicked. <laughs> Uh, well, good morning. Uh, 
We're back uh, from a trip to last week to Washington, D.C. to see the congressmen and uh, women. Uh, <clears throat> it was cold. It, there was periods of freezing rain and some snow flurries, but uh, uh, the situation hasn't changed back in Washington, D.C. hardly at all, <laughs> except there's a new set of reasons why they can't do anything for the next two years. <clears throat> uh, it, you know, other than that, uh, you know, there are some Republicans and Democrats talking to one another, but there doesn't appear to be anything being done. I think it was enlightening for the people to uh, meet people back in Washington, D.C., meet each other. It was a good networking deal. Uh, from the Orange County perspective, I want to thank uh, <clears throat> the Municipal Water District of Orange County and Brett Barbary for putting together a uh, no a function along with the Orange County Water District and a num number of other people where we had uh, all the Orange County delegation I think Brett came uh, to this and uh, <clears throat> appeared at the delegation we had poster boards up there about projects that you know the districts were looking at uh, asking for federal money on so it was a very productive uh, deal now this week <clears throat> on Wednesday they had the equivalent up in the state legislature up in Sacramento the congeniality between the Republicans and Democrats up there you know appears to be much better than that in the Congress uh, a lot of that is due to this huge freshman class in the legislature that happened you know uh, two years ago so that roughly half the legislature, or slightly more than half the legislature, were newly elected people. And whether they were Republicans or Democrats, a number of them decided or campaigned that they really want to make government work. So there was more good vibrations coming off the meetings with uh, the legislators in the meetings. And there was a discussion, reasonably robust discussion about groundwater uh, the Groundwater Act and where we're going from that and other issues, you know, that uh, are being pursued. Uh, next week, uh, Aqua is having their Energy Committee is actually doing something interesting. They're going out to the ISO, the Independent System Operator, which runs the transmission for the electrical system within the state. This was a consequence of the big <clears throat> you know, disaster we had uh, uh, when we uh, deregulated the electric industry. Uh, the ISO came out of that. Uh, uh, it will be an interesting program, and I think uh, there'll be side conversations with staff members and things. The water industry is actually probably the biggest battery, storage battery in the state. If you think about it, you know, we have the reservoirs uh, that operate up, and they can generate on peak power and we can operate the system since we're using it at less than full capacity or half capacity or I guess 20 percent from the state system. Uh, we can use the system in off-peak power. The ISO is looking at reaching down to individual districts to you know so they can switch on and off power and uh, ex you know recommending that uh, or talking about offering a better rate for the people who allow them to do that with a one day notice than 15 minutes notice how much can you shed from your system to get a better rate so there are a lot of interesting things going on the board meets at the end of the month and if there are no questions that's my report thank you thank you Pierre. Okay, now we can jump into our program for the day. We've had many presentations in the past on uh, the uh, activities at JPL and and uh, and uh, and the Caltech on weather, weather sensing, uh, trying to get a different perspective on analyzing hydrologic features, and so we're going to get an update on this uh, significant research and new perspective on. Uh, in trying to figure out how much water we have. And I'd like to introduce our, not introduce, but have our uh, uh, Waco member, Fred, uh, come up and, and, and uh, he was instrumental in getting our speakers today and he can introduce them and the program. It's all yours, Fred. Thank you, Don. Yeah, I'm Fred O'Callaghan. Most of you have seen me around here. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, two speakers uh, today, uh, two atmospheric and 
uh, geology scientists. Uh, we are going to try and make uh, these talks, I would call it water-centric, uh, to meet your interests and needs here. There's a lot of stuff going on in NASA and JPL that uh, is very exciting and is going to carry us well into the in this century and it's going to have impacts on water predictions and management and all that goes. So I, I'm, I propose to the system having a series of talks on these subjects and here we are. We have, uh, we have two uh, scientists here today. Uh, the first one I think most of you have met before and that's uh, Dr. Michael Gunson. Uh, he got his PhD from Bristol University. JPL was very fortunate many, many years ago now uh, get, getting Mike to come from England here and to work for JPL. He and I have worked on two instruments together, which I was the project manager of very successfully. Four times we flew on the shuttle and uh, there's an instrument now, a weather satellite that's flying uh, for the 13th year, still in service, gonna be in service for many years to come. And so uh, with that, Mike's gonna talk today about uh, perspectives on the uh, tools and, and uh, equipment that's available uh, in the 21st century, uh, what's going on at JPL, and some updates on our, our latest missions that are going on. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce also, so I don't have too many jump ups here, our second speaker, uh, uh, Thomas Painter, who is a the principal investigator. I think most of you know what a PI is. The PI is, is the principal investigator on an instrument. Uh, he manages it. He manages the science. He manages the operation, you know, sets forth the science team, et cetera. And he, uh, Tom received his PhD from Santa Barbara University, California, Santa Barbara. He's been at JPL now, what, seven years? Five, Five years, thank you. And uh, he's the principal investigator on the Airborne Snow Observatory. It's a technique for measuring the amount of snow that's in the mountains and the amount of water that's gonna come out of the, the snow. So it's a vital importance to us to be able to know about these things in advance. So with that, I'll get off of the podium here and uh, thank the speakers very much for coming. Two things from coming today this morning through the traffic from Pasadena and two, giving up their holiday. This is, uh, we have this rotating schedule and turns out this is an RDO these guys probably always work anyway, but <laughs> this is their day off. So with that, welcome our two speakers. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to try and make this presentation from my laptop because there's at least one animation in here which I'll be supremely disappointed with if we transfer and we don't get to use it. So what do we do now? There we go. So I thought this morning, and, and can I just say thanks to Fred and Don for allowing us to come back. Uh, part of uh, the pleasure of working at JPL, and, and uh, Tom and I were saying it's just so much fun uh, being at JPL in many different ways, but if we don't get out of the uh, lab every now and again to talk to people, <laughs> Uh, it's really, uh, you know, you get into the ivory tower syndrome quite quickly, if I may say. So this is a, an opportunity. Please, I hope we have time for you to come and ask us questions and uh, get in some engagement. There is nothing more important as a Californian as water resource management. Uh, here we are in this great state, and uh, I was talking to some other folks, which I'll introduce later in this talk, and. There is nothing more important as Californians to look at what we know and, and the capabilities we have in NASA and at JPL in how we can help in these uh, conditions we're experiencing now, the drought conditions. What I'm going to try and do today, he said quickly, is give you a little update and leave plenty of time for Tom to come talk to you about the Airborne Snow Observatory. I think that's one of the most 
uh, interesting developments over the past few years where our research and, cap and capabilities have moved to a direct application in helping understand uh, water resources in California, if not the, uh, throughout the Western United States. So I, this image, by the way, is something I'm going to come back to in my talk. I, I'm, I'm just going to touch on about half a dozen different topics, so not a lot in great depth, but and probably reinforces messages that uh, you heard in the preamble. Um, uh, it's not a pretty situation. Um, I've mentioned this in the past, but NASA, uh, I think we're known at JPL perhaps for planetary exploration, or we're known for the, uh, the, two ro the three rovers that, or the four rovers that have landed on Mars and given us such startling new insights into the red planet. But in the background, NASA has a huge Earth science research program, and there are something like, I think the number now has to go up to 19 operating satellite systems with a number more planned for launch and deployment in the coming decades. Uh, and in particular, this past year has been something of a banner year for new satellite systems to go into orbit. And I'm going to give you a little personal remark at the beginning about what I've been doing for the past year with the Orbiting Carbon Observatory which we were fortunate to be one of the five systems launched in this past 12 months. And that is my other day job, uh, being the Orbiting Carbon Observatory project scientist, uh, in addition to trying helping in water resource management and other applications in the state. Uh, I'll come back to this figure, but um, we at JPL have uh, had two recent launches. Does this come up with? OK. Um, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory uh, was, in, was actually, just to give you the timescales of how these ventures come about, was first discussed as a kind of water cooler idea back in maybe 1999 uh, in a conversation between two colleagues over what if. It became a proposal concept in around about 2000, was submitted to NASA in 2002, and it was launched last year. And uh, it, the fact that Fred and I have worked on two projects together, and I've worked on four different instrument satellite projects at JPL, it, uh, I've just been tremendously fortunate. Because on life cycles of a decade, you don't get to do that many times. You just, just immense amount of uh, effort and patience in order to get to the final product of a system in space. So the Orbiting Carbon Observatory is in, was intended to met, is is today measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere around the world. And it's intended, as I'll make one or two quick remarks on, to help us understand uh, where and when carbon dioxide is drawn in by the biosphere, plants, uh, and or the ocean. And of course, in both of those systems, respiration puts carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere, and there's a big balance between when do plants draw it in, when do things uh, respire and put carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere? When does cold water absorb carbon dioxide into the ocean? And when does warm water lead to X solution, uh, carbon dioxide coming out of a solution going back into the atmosphere? They're the two big uh, exchanges which we would like to understand far better with the backdrop that we as human beings need fossil fuels for energy and we're putting carbon dioxide steadily more and more into, into the air. Serendipitously, in the top corner here, uh, I probably, I would love to uh, get my colleague Christian Frankenberg to come down and, and give you a talk about one of the uh, m uh, most fortuitous accidental discoveries of the past decade, known by plant biologists for a long, long time, that when chlorophyll, chloroplasts, are actually active in the midst of photosynthesis, the little bit of the sunlight they absorb gets re-emitted as a fluorescence light, slightly redshifted. We can actually see that in space. Plants glowing. Who knew? So it, it turns out that there are little slivers, colors, in the sunlight where the sun's atmosphere actually absorbs the solar radiation, actually sunlight, so they're dark. And you can look in those dark windows and see the light added to it by plants. 
and that allows us to detect the fluorescence of plants when they're growing. So that little map up there, you can see the bright yellow areas are where you're seeing fluorescence from plants, and they correspond, obviously, with the great rainforests of the Amazon, the Congo, and the uh, and in Southwest uh, Asia. Um, it turns out you can also see the Midwest when the when we are in the midst of the peak growing season for all the great cereals we grow out there, you can see those plants for us as well. So this is a brand new space more measurement, just, just one of those great accidents of life, which I think will be important to understand the role of uh, crop yields, their response to drought, because plants don't grow when you put them under stress of not having water. So this is one of those great discoveries that Christian Frankenberg, my, co my colleague, has been pioneering now, and we're exploring with our new observations. The other more relevant to water resource management is the soil moisture active passive. If anybody could have come up with a geekier name, I defy you. <laughs> it, 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 it got put in place when uh, the National Academy of Sciences did a report for NASA, NOAA, on the next decade of future missions, and they labeled, they tried to be agnostic in labeling all their recommendations with the geekiest names possible. And they labeled it SMAP, and it never changed. It was, uh, there was quite a discussion of whether we could give it something more catchy, but it's lived on a SMAP. It was launched on January 31st, and just last week on February 24th, they finally deployed not only the boom, but also this great massive uh, six meter antenna. And it's like one gigantic origami project gone wrong. <laughs> well, it gone right. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it managed to just, it's just managed to be deployed. It now is spinning up, it, may, it, it rotates, I think it's 14 revs a minute, and it allows the, uh, the passive and active systems, the at long wavelength, to scan and sweep the surface below them. It will be used to, it, to, to measure the moisture content of the top five centimeters of soil. There are many other applications, including when we're over the uh, north, you can detect the transition between the, f uh, between the freeze and the thaw period. And when that happens, uh, a great portion of the northern reaches start to uh, become active and start growing. So this is a, an important indicator of when those remote areas in Siberia, Alaska, North America, and Europe, the, the trees there, the great boreal forests, has become start to grow. They go as soon as you switch that that make that switch between freezing and thawing, they start to grow, and there is a massive drawdown in the northern hemisphere due to that growth period, that drawdown in carbon dioxide. But it has obvious, obvious applications in understanding drought conditions and the availability of moisture in the top five centimeters of soil. Uh, I don't have anything more to say about that because the guys on that team are gonna be busy for the next few months trying to make sure that everything's working and getting those kind of, that kind of information out of that brand new satellite system. I've been here before to talk about uh, what it means after 12 years to get to a launch situation. And last July the 1st, uh, I persuaded uh, my wife and son to come with me out to uh, Lompoc to see the launch at 2.53 in the morning. It was about, yeah. <laughs> it was about a thousand of us waiting to be bussed out to Vandenberg Air Force Base. And if you've ever done this, they take you to the officers club and the golf course and you sit outside the fence. 2.56, 40 seconds before launch, one of the sprinkler systems, get this, sprinkler systems fail to engage. They use water spray to, as an acoustic suppression and it failed to engage and we, didn't, we had to scrub the launch for that evening. So there's a thousand people on 20, 30 buses going out to, to Lompoc and tell you, it takes a long time to organize that number of people back onto buses to get them back to uh, Buellton. Next night, 200, 250 of us go out for the launch, 2.56 in the morning, and I broke out into hysterical laughter. 
I saw not a blessed photon. It was all socked in. All I could hear was the rumble in the distance. <laughs> Boy, what did I, did I, I have a teenage son. I, I heard that all the way back. <laughs> we did what for why? <laughs> But uh, let me tell you, I, I was, it was one of those, you know, I'm sleep deprived, a little crazy, and I'm laughing hysterically. Uh, sorry. But fortunately, they had some great photographs. The, peop the smarter people, i.e. the nighttime, uh, there's a lot of amateur astronomers who go out taking photographs, were stationed above the marine layer and took some beautiful time-elapsed photographs. This is probably the best of the bunch because you can see the Milky Way in the background on this long exposure. And this is the uh, launch vehicle going off over the south. I, in, the past, in the past, I've stayed at home in Pasadena, quite frankly, for any of these launches, because I know if I pop out, get out of bed at just the right time, pop outside, I can see the launch vehicle go over the horizon. It's a beautiful view. So I'm, I'm disinclined, disinclined now. <laughs> How long was this? What was the duration of the photo? That looks to me like, uh, I, I, I don't actually know, but I... I I know that that's like five, five, ten minutes to get that far. Well, it's a beautiful. You might mention that the polar orbiters that we, yeah, that's why we have to go out of here. Now. That's right. Uh, for safety reasons, you launch out of what we call the Western Test Range, which is the Vandenberg Air Force Base, because you're going to launch south over the ocean. If you're going into a, a, low, a different inclination orbit, you can go out of the Eastern Test Range at Kennedy Space Center, and you go out over the Atlantic. So shuttle launches were always out at Kennedy. Everything else is launched on the West Coast somewhere. Um, and for those, I, I, you probably don't know this, but um, we actually had an incarnation of this uh, satellite called the OCO. There's a good reason why there's an OCO-2, because when we launched the vehicle the first time, the fairing which encapsulates the, the system failed to separate. And it failed to achieve orbit and went swimming with the fishes somewhere in the South, South Pacific. So this time, we installed a camera. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you, when we got that video back, there was a lot of relieved sighs around the whole project. But that's, that's my, this is my day job. I'm probably not going to spend looking at the time. I'm, I want to give Tom all the time he can. But there's lots of good reasons why what we're trying to achieve is is really trying to understand why uh, a f only half of what we put in the atmosphere in terms of carbon dioxide, and it's increasing year by year, those are the green bars, but on average only half of it remains there. Those blue bars represent what is drawn out or taken in some, somewhere. We simply don't know enough about how the Earth works to understand what the future may look like under changing loads of carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere. So one of the objectives, you know, a lot of people ask me, is this to look at what we do as human beings? Not quite. The real questions about how does the Earth respond? Why does carbon dioxide so variable in the amount that's drawn in by the land biosphere or the oceans? And the big suspects, quite frankly, are very obvious. It's drought impact and water availability in the great rainforest is the current best theory. So. That's something of, that's my day job. Um, <laughs> we've got our first data out. It's a tremendous, um, this was a video and I couldn't find the original to make it just spin on its top and look all magical. It turned out the first data we got, just a remark, is in October. It is boring as all get out. It is the time of year when the difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is, is practically zero because that's the point of the year where after the summer change when all the plants are drawing in carbon dioxide, you're now into the, post, you're into the period where that stopped and respiration and human emissions in the north where most of us live are picked up again and the carbon dioxide levels are rising to the point where they match what's in the south. In the south, fewer human beings, less signals from the biosphere. So it's generally a smoother, less varying amount of carbon dioxide. It is as boring as all get out. So I'm excited to look at what happens in May and June when you start to see this immense signal of carbon dioxide being taken up by plants in the north. 
I, I talked about this, I won't go there. So of all of the satellites that NASA has, this identifies those which are actually part of the studies of the water cycle. Uh, it, it, we can touch on aspects of um, snow, snowfall, precipitation as rain, to cloud cover, the various aspects of the ocean, evaporation, uh, all the elements I can think of in the, in the water cycle. The challenge for us as scientists is that this was driven by research needs. And where we are today, I think, is recognizing that I, I've said this, and it's very trite, but I think, as a scientist, I am pretty confident the answer about climate change hasn't changed very much since Vanti Augustus Arrhenius in 1896 said that you'll get about a three to four degree centigrade warming by doubling carbon dioxide. All the technology in the world, big computers, have only refined that number. They have not changed it one iota. So my, where we are today, I think, is that we're in a, a period where probably NASA, everybody, we're transitioning from not what we know as a research topic, but in terms of understanding and applications. How does this help us in the challenges before it is in, in water resource management globally, globally, not just here in the West, and food security? That's where I personally think the rubber hits the road. So of this, um, as an example of, of the challenge and ongoing discourse, we're very, very fortunate on Wednesday to host uh, uh, Secretary uh, Karen Ross and Secretary Ana Cal Caballero from, uh, uh, from Sacramento. Uh, Secretary Karen Ross is the, uh, for Agriculture and Food. Uh, Secretary Ana Caballero, I've got this right, is Business Opportunity and Consumer Affairs. The uh, Daniel Boot from uh, California Office of Emergency Management Services, uh, the Seismic Commission. And we had what are the necessary conversations about where are the challenges in the state and where can we help. Um, this is the reason why I'm always happy to come and talk about this because among you are the requirements of what we need to know to help in different aspects of managing water, food security, etc. It's absolutely essential for that dialogue to occur. So. Now, back to what I would call recent news. I found this just the other day. I'd, I'd seen last winter's comparison between 2013 and 2014. On the left here are a pair of images taken by the NASA NOAA orbiting platform. It's now named Suomi after Vern Suomi, one of the great scientists. And you can see a couple of things immediately. You can see the comparison from 2014 2015, February 1st, January 31st, roughly the same time of year, the, the Central Valley is distinctly greener. And that's because we've had so much rain in December. So in actual fact, the valley is much greener, uh, you know, California is much greener this year, at this time of year, than preceding years. But I, I, I don't want to do what you'd have to do, which is do cloud filtering off these images. Uh, but... Um, by eye, I would say there's quite a little bit less snow in the Sierras than there was last year. And Tom's going to speak, at that, speak to that in more detail with recent data he's acquired this winter. Now, the other component of this I thought was worth remarking on is just to bring you up to date on what sea level um, measurements from Jason have revealed. And I just want to remind you with this one image that this is 2010 when we had our last El Nino and you can see that this is the sea level height that occurs when warm water is bubbling up. So this is not temperature, this is sea level height from the mean. And you get higher levels of the, the, the ocean levels rise in the eastern Pacific in an El Nino year. In a La Nina year, it tends to be the warm pool is out there in the western Pacific of Indonesia. So here we are. This was January. Uh, these are monthly composites that, that are available on the web. And this is February. And I think it was yesterday, NOAA announced that uh, they, they acknowledged that this was an El Nino. 
and it, but a very, very weak one. And we, you know, if our expectation was that an El Nino year would be associated with significant changes in precipitation patterns in the West, I'll let you decide what your interpretation of the situation is. It just hasn't happened. Ironically, the cold weather that uh, was referred to earlier about the snow, it's anecdotally, when we have big El Nino years where we get, you know, one of the weather patterns that seems to locate is the jet stream tends to bring uh, uh, increased cold snow weather patterns to the northeast of uh, the United States and, because I have to call home now and again, uh, to the UK as well. And I can confirm both. So even though we haven't had a change in wet weather, there are typical El Nino-like conditions manifesting themselves around the globe except here. Okay, um, I believe, uh, I, I thought I'd include this because uh, Jay Famoglietti, who is now at JPL, gave a little update to the secretaries earlier this year, uh, earlier this week on, on Wednesday, and I thought he pro produced an interesting set of observations from, um, inferred from these, these satellites, the Gravity uh, Recovery and Climate Experiment, GRACE, mm -hmm. which is a pair of satellites that as they r orbit the Earth, they track the relative position relative to each other. And when the mass of water underneath increases or decreases, their position changes because the, the, the mass draw of gravity changes and their position uh, changes very slightly. It's allowed people like Jay to do some remarkable things. And I'm not going to, we're fortunate. You see, this is why you have to do it from your laptop. You can actually have an animation. And this is a time series since the beginning of uh, the GRACE mission of changes in the gravity, the mass total in California. And you can see it tracking from 2002 to the present day, close to it. And you can see that when it's changed to a deep red, that is a reduction in the mass underneath, uh, underneath the satellites. This is total. So it, you're seeing a change of not just surface water, but subsurface water as well. Uh, we're asked this question, it's like a, it's every molecule of water that changes the total mass under, underneath you is largely responsible for that. So this then leads to the conversation about, and this is now an estimate of the change in that signal, but plotted as a function of time. And, it's, and it really what we're trying to draw your attention to is the seasonal oscillations, i.e. wet winter, recharge and increase in surface water and recharge of the aquifers. But we've been in a couple of uh, drought cycles and you can see that relatively speaking, we're now, we've seen a continued decline in the mass in the Central Valley. And that's because of uh, continued drafting of aquifer water to tide us over through these drought periods. And you, it's significant. That is 40 odd square kilometers of water. It's a huge amount of water that's been displaced, used, and drawn out of the ground, and not replenished. So th this was just to put a color code to it. I probably won't draw on that. Oh, so w something new I hadn't seen from Jay was this plot, and I'll try and explain it. And the top is that variation. He's now tried to take the seasonal variation, the mean seasonal variation out of it, so you can look at the deficit and estimate what is that in terms of water. And you can see we're trending. Increasingly, our deficit in what we've withdrawn is increasing with time. And um, I, I'm, I'm kind of worried that we're entering into an even more difficult year right now. Uh, with this is another activity that Tom Farr has been uh, leading in terms of using satellite radar data to look at changes in surface deformation. So you can measure very, very accurately changes in the surface position for, by repeated overflights with the radar system. And I've shown this before to you, but this is actually six months of last year. And you can see the scale on the top there between um, one or two inches up all the way to depression, uh, sorry, one or two inches down all the way to deformation over six months of nearly one foot. And you can see that 
is just another evidence of the continuing effects of relying and drafting groundwater. Uh, you, there's always going to be a price to pay. Uh, and it goes through regions where we are planning to either build significant infrastructure like the high-speed rail, or it comes close to the, um, <laughs> the California aqueduct. So I, I, I want to close here because I want to give Tom plenty of time. Um, we have been working hard to identify those areas in the future water availability where we can use our capabilities. Uh, we're, we won't stop looking at what we can actually do. Um, Tom's going to describe much, much more of that top left uh, portion there about our snowpack. But we've been working to look at ways of understanding the Bay Delta. Uh, we've had various interactions with MWD and other uh, finding people with the right pockets with money to actually fund <laughs> these activities because we're soft money people. We're not. We 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 don't. We're Caltech employees, and we have to write proposals to gain funding. Uh, we're looking at ET groundwater storage um, integration of modeling prediction. Uh, I think there's two kind of challenges. Just to before I close, I think there's the challenge of understanding what water you have, and the biggest challenge is getting a good prediction for the next rainy season. Uh, and uh, previously, Dwayne Wallace has been here to talk about atmospheric rivers. It's a huge challenge to figure out what the likelihood are with some certainty on how many big precipitation events per season we're going to get, because that's going to help understand not what we do this year, which I know MWD probably feels pretty comfortable about for, 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 the, for the region, but what does it mean if you don't know what's going to happen, not this winter, but next winter, and what's going to happen the, 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 the dry season after. So with that, um, we're working hard to uh, really improve our, uh, get our capabilities to applications. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the opportunity to come and speak to you today, but in the words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different, and my good colleague, Tom Painter. <laughs> And for those of you who know that quote, I don't have three buttocks. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to see that. <laughs> it worked. All right, let's see. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Airborne Snow Observatory and, and where we're headed. Um, and then some of the updates uh, from, from this year. And actually, the, the plane is flying. It'll start flying about 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, over the Tuolumne Basin, um, and so I'm frequently asked, "Are, are you planning on killing off the uh, the snow courses and the snow pillow uh, team?" Or that's Frank Gerke, are you planning on killing off Frank? No, we want to keep Frank, um, and we also want to keep the snow courses, and they these are really critical to uh, to this program. Uh, to, to actually know what's going on on the ground and, and also being able to help us with uh, constraint on, on density retrievals. So <clears throat> I'm just going to talk quickly about what controls snowmelt. Um, uh, obviously knowing snow water equivalent is really important, but also knowing how quickly it comes out of the mountains uh, is, is key in managing that, uh, that most critical resource. So let's see. Do you need me to stand here? Yes. I can't move? Okay, good. Thank you. So, because I'm plenty loud. Um, so, so this is five days of energy balance measurements uh, at one of our towers in, in Colorado, the Antipagre Basin. And the black and trace here, and it's really warm days. Uh, so, so there should be lots of energy coming from the atmosphere. The black trace is the net flux. That's the amount of energy that goes to melting snow. Okay, so obviously, middle of the day, you get a lot of energy from the sun, and also things are warming up. Well, the red trace is the net solar radiation. That's how much energy is absorbed by the snowpack. Well, they almost lie atop one another, and these others are the various components that are related to temperature. Uh, the sensible heating, which is just how much you feel of the, the warmth of the atmosphere, 
And then the long wave uh, is the, uh, this red trace, right? and that's the emission by the atmosphere <coughs> down to the surface, and then the surface re-emitting in the balance. It turns out with a snowpack, that's always negative, because there's a lot of mass of snow, and a melting snowpack pumps out almost all the radiation that it possibly can. So, so the rest of these components pretty much balance out, and the big driver is how much sunlight is absorbed by the snowpack. Now, how does that play out? So this is, a, uh, this is from a paper that we're just submitting right now, and it's looking at uh, four rivers coming out of the, uh, the Colorado River Basin. <coughs> and their, the sensitivity of their rising limb, so how quickly does the river start to, uh, to rise in the spring to peak? So each of these is a, is a hydrograph up to its peak, and, um, and what we have on the left is color coding of the traces from the onset of melt to the, to the peak. Color coded according to how dirty or clean the snowpack is. Now some of you may have heard about dust and snow and what impact it's having on snow melt in the Colorado River Basin. Well, so this is how dirty or clean the snowpack is, and then this is the metric of, of temperature, how warm or cool the spring is. And what you can see is that the, the rainbow is pretty well ordered here and the rainbow's all mixed, mixed up over here. So what this says is that the cleaner the snowpack, the shallower the rising limb of the hydrograph. The dirtier the snowpack, the steeper the rising limb of the hydrograph. And it's quite consistent through all of these rivers. So it doesn't matter how warm or cool the spring is, what matters is how dirty or clean the snowpack is. Right? And that dust is coming, in this case, you can see it down here. That dust is primarily coming from the Colorado Plateau, some of it from the Mojave, some of it even from Asia, and in some places uh, it's black carbon, so in, in the Sierra Nevada that's happening. Now how does, that, <clears throat> how does that play out? Well, and what's normal? So this is a paper we published a few years ago. Starting in about the 1850s, when we started inhabiting the interior of the western U.S., there were cryptobiotic soils, uh, desert pavements, etc., that we broke through with largely with sheep, uh, to a lesser degree with uh, with cattle, and then there are a lot of people that like to think that the roads out in the deserts are contributing to huge dust signals, but that's simply not the case because they just they're very skinny; they don't produce much dust. But the this somewhat Brownian motion of of Hooved animals across the landscape. That allows us to break through the crusts and then see this dramatic increase in dust accumulation up in the mountains. So we presently have about five to seven times more dust in the mountain snowpack at the Colorado River Basin than we did before about the 1850s. So we set out to figure out what impact that's had on the Colorado River. And the summary slide of this is the, the naturalized flow at, at Lee's Ferry. Right, so present conditions. Um, the is the red trace here. Right? <clears throat> so that's the this is the average uh, runoff hydrograph at Lee's Ferry, and so what it has is a, is a steeper rising limb, and the blue is what it would have been prior to that disturbance. So if you if you remove that amount of dust that uh, has increased, right? So it's a shallower rising limb. The other thing to notice is that. So they share this integral. So if you integrate these, that's how much water you have in the year, right? So they share this part of the integral, and this sliver is smaller than this sliver. So we've been finding with models of varying uh, complexity, consistent message that with the dust acceleration of snow melt, you have less water in the river channel. And on average, we think this is a conservative <coughs> estimate, but we have about 5% less. And it runs, it depends on the year, it depends on how deep the snowpack is and how dirty it is, but it runs anywhere from 3 to 10% difference in the annual flow, simply due to that earlier acceleration of snow melt, and what that does to evaporation and the growing season all across the, uh, the Colorado River. <coughs> so this is being considered now, so dust mitigation is being considered by the the Bureau of Reclamation for uh, flow augmentation in the Colorado River. Um, and so we need to know how dirty the snowpack is. Right? That's the main point I wanted to make there. 
And then we have a collaboration going on with Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, the National Weather Service uh, uh, entity that takes care of the Colorado River and the Eastern Great Basin. Um, and we're using our satellite retrievals of snow cover, so, so what Mike showed uh, earlier a couple times. And that, we're helping them to, with their forecasting, they've actually never included satellite imagery in, uh, in their operations. And so this is the first project to do that. And they've actually found the first thing is to figure out, gosh, our model says there's no snow, but you're showing there's snow. Let's nudge the snow water equivalent. Um, and we can, they can nudge it to try to fit their, their forecasts to the observations, but they don't actually know how much to nudge the snow water equivalent at all. We still need snow water equivalent. Um, so many people need snow water equivalent. So, so this is the way that we've been doing it. This is the way we've been doing it for over a century, right? With the snow tube, <laughs> thanks to Dr. James Church at the University of Nevada, Reno. And, and these are used as index sizes. They are not intended to do the full quantification of the, the volume. They're intended to be an index so that your regression can then be leveraged for how much water is going to be coming out. And then in the 70s and 80s, the snow pillows started going in. I explained, you guys will get this, I explained it to, uh, to, to students that these are like, the snow pillows are like water beds, way water beds. And they all look at me like, oh, no. <laughs> they don't know what a water bed is. <laughs> but you guys do. <laughs> all right, so, so this is the way, with those, these, each of these red dots that shows up, and there's one in the E up there, all right, each of these red dots is either a snow course or a snow pillow in the Tuolumne River Basin. And each one of them, their area represented, is magnified by 3,600 times in this basin. All right? it's, about, it's about 460 square miles. And there's a hell of a lot of snow up there and down here and over here that's simply not sampled. We're just looking at those as, as index sites. And yet, now that we're starting to push through and our, our demand is exceeding the supply, independent of the drought, uh, but now that we have the drought, it's getting even worse, we really need to start quantifying it. So this is the way that we see snow water equivalent right now. This is the way that we want to see it. And this is about 39 million times more coverage. ABC up in San Francisco did a piece on this earlier this week, I think it was. And, um, and it was cool how they represented 39 million times more coverage. They had a, a, a video of Frank Gerke, uh, the snow groundhog. Um, and they just replicated his picture over and over on the screen. Um, so it was 39 million times more Frank Gerke's. Yeah. So, all right, so to know the mountain snowpack uh, timing and magnitude of runoff, the two things that you need to know most critically are simply how much mass there is, how much water there is. So the snow water equivalent, and the second is you need to know the snow albedo on top of each of those snow water equivalents so that you can know how rapidly it's going to melt and come out of the mountains. So, um, so fortunately, JPL invited me to come about five years ago, and Mike didn't know what was coming. Um, <clears throat> but we... Um, the main reason I wanted to come was to be able to take advantage of the technologies that have been developed at JPL as well as other parts of NASA. Um, but in particular, I was a spectroscopist. And what, what JPL has done is a lot is sending spectrometers out into the solar system, going and looking at Mars. We have a, we have a spectrometer orbiting Mars right now and going out to, uh, to the Jovian system and looking at Europa um, and out to Saturn. We actually don't have a global imaging spectrometer, all right, which is kind of, it's very much like Star Trek, um, orbiting Earth. So we actually don't know Earth in certain ways as well as we know uh, some of the other planets. Yes, sir. It seems to me you, you would do more in the Tuolumne area. I mean, yeah, there's four or five spots up here and two down below. It seems to me you want a bigger <coughs> scan over that. Well, you, we're doing the whole, so we're doing the whole oh, thing. Oh yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, so that whole, that map that we showed was from was from ASL. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. So, so we now so we couple for the Airborne Snow Observatory, we couple the two technologies to get at the albedo and the snow water equivalent. So we use an imaging spectrometer, right? And the spectrometer measures in about a hundred different wavelengths or colors. 
And the reason we want to do that is that in different parts of the solar spectrum, there's indications of absorption by different things. So as snow grains get bigger, that absorbs more sunlight, that accelerates melt. Well, that's expressed in the near infrared wavelengths. If dust and black carbon are deposited on the surface, well, we can actually see those. So that's primarily in the visible wavelengths. But the more concentrated they get, it creeps out into the near infrared. All right, and being able to quantify that and really have a good handle on the perturbation to snow melt rates requires that you understand what those changes are and then what the processes are. So the mitigation by the Bureau of Reclamation can only be done, they can only understand the efficacy of that if they're measuring it and knowing that there's actually a change and it's not simply been some hydrologic or, or meteorologic phenomenon. All right, so, so that's what the spectrometer gives us. It's sitting here, it's on a plate looking out the bottom of the, uh, the aircraft. And then right in front of it is uh, a scanning LIDAR. So this is a uh, high frequency uh, laser pointer with a detector, all right? So if you could move your thumb 800,000 times a second and measure the signal, that's what you would have. And so we have the aircraft uh, blasting along at nearly 200 knots. And uh, then we're spraying you know, 800,000 pulses per second and measuring those, capturing each one of those, and saying, OK, it took this long to get to the surface. And that then gives you the topography. And that's all we're measuring is the topography. But we fly before there's snow on the ground. And that gives us the baseline topography. The difference between those two is the snow depth. So we get to snow water equivalent through the snow depth. The reason that we want to go through snow depth is that it is the greater control on the variation in snow water equivalent. Right? So, so snow water equivalent is depth times density. And the density doesn't change very much. And what we found from about 40 years of effort at JPL and other places uh, is that there's huge complexity. There's huge complexity in the uh, in the mountains are in, inside the snowpack with the with radar signal. It's really hard to tell what the hell's going on. And if you just, but you can tell the density, you can model the density, and you can know it quite predictably, and it doesn't change much across the landscape, whereas the depth changes an enormous amount. And so that's the path that we've taken. And so I'm going to go back over here, sorry. Um, it's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The Sundance Kid always had to move. Right? You couldn't shoot unless you could move. Um, so, so this gives us the first quantification of snow volume over the entire basin. So you're not having to use an index site. You're not having to use those to interpolate and extrapolate. It also gives us the first robust quantification of snow melt timing and snowfall. So we can fly immediately before a snowfall event and immediately after. The difference between those two is the spatial distribution of snowfall, which has never been accessible to us. So the other thing that we're working toward right now, and, and we're doing wintertime flights uh, in the Tuolumne, and we're soon going to be doing them in, uh, in the Green River in Wyoming, uh, is to get to much improved allocations. And the representative from Met, who's, I guess he's out side now, um, was talking about allocations, but there's <coughs> enormous uncertainty in how much water there actually is up there. Right? This gives us the ability to go and quantify that quite tightly. And then likewise to give us much improved runoff. <coughs> All right, so how does this how does this work? Well here here's the laser pointer uh, spraying the pulses out. And we have two lasers, one tipped slightly forward and one slightly backwards. And uh, they're scanning offset from each other. And it just lays down this beautiful pattern of uh, laser points all over. We get about four laser pulses per square meter right, from, the out, from the altitude that we fly. If we get a little closer, we could figure out the shape of your head. Um, with the with the spectrometer or with the uh, with the lidar, it's just... in some cases that would be good, in other cases that'd be bad. All right, this is what a, a... this was what. Good question on the snow. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that there's very little variation in the density, but yet there's powder and there's ice. Yeah, and and I would think there would be a 
significant difference in densities. So there's different densities within the column. But when you have this density profile here, 100 meters over there, 5 kilometers over there, it's not going to be that different relative to how the, the snow depth varies. So the densities march together into the future. So you get new snowfall. And you're absolutely right. We, we do know that in some places it's, you have new snow, and in others it rained on top of it. So those we have to be able to predict well where the rain snow line was and where there's new snow. But the nice thing is with the spectrometer, we can tell where there's new snow. I mean, with the LIDAR, we can tell where there's new snow. And, um, and so being able to constrain those densities is, is much easier than the whole package making that measurement from, from the bulk. All right. This is what the transit to the Merced looks like. All right, so this is flying out of the Mammoth Airport. And then we're going to head over. You'll see Mono Lake showing up over here. And we're going to fly right across the, uh, the Lyle Fork of the Tuolumne. Here we go. That's, this is Rush Creek. That's operated uh, by Southern California Edison. There's Tuolumne Meadows down there. Hetch Hetchy's going to show up right up here. There it is. And then we're going to bank back around, and we're going to head right up the Lyle Fork and into the Bursad. This is a GoPro on the, uh, on the tail section of the aircraft. And what's really cool is Channel 4 now uses that. Whenever they do a snow report, uh, LA Channel 4, the NBC station, uses this image. Even if there's no plane involved with their report, they're still using it. Yes, sir? You're measuring in millimeters. How do you adjust for the fact the airplane's not moving up? It's moving up and down. Just curious. Oh, so Okay, so I didn't describe that, but, but mounted inside the, uh, the LIDAR housing is what's called an IMU. It's an inertial measurement unit. All right, so it's GPS, and it also has an acceler accelerometer like you have in your, your cell phone, except a really, really, really expensive one. And, and you, so you need to know very precisely uh, the altitude of the aircraft as well as the attitude of the aircraft relative to your plate where your instruments are mounted. So we keep track of that through, we get a trajectory uh, file that comes off the plane, but then uh, the GPS has to be adjusted for. So we have different times when different uh, um, quality of GPS adjustments from base stations uh, are available. So we have to wait a little while to get uh, the cleaner ones, and then those factor into creating what's called the SBET, the smooth best estimate of trajectory. And it's absolutely critical to to knowing the uh, essentially knowing the the topography. It's remarkable how it all comes down to one particular file that's 17, 17 uh, columns and uh, and many million uh, uh, lines. And it, and actually, it's a good point right here. Um, so the data processing is, is a really critical part of this. So we have two instruments that are bringing in a ton of data. And when we pull the, the data disks off the plane at the end of a flight, we're pulling off nearly a terabyte of data. And then we plug them into our supercomputer that we have to bring up to the plane or to near the plane because we simply can't push all the data through the, the World Wide Web to get to JPL to then process it. Uh, the snow would all have melted before we could push just a single, single line. Um, but I, I gave my team the direction before we even started this that we are by God going to crank out the products in less than 24 hours so that this is relevant for water managers. Because otherwise it's purely research. Right? There's no operational capacity if you're giving them information a few months later. And, um, and several of the team who have been involved with other activities like this rolled their eyes, joked with each other, and then some of them even told me straight up that I was insane, and, um, which made me worried because uh, I was relying on them. But, uh, but then I kept a straight face and kept pushing, and, and then we ended up doing it, and we're down to about 20-hour turnaround of that processing. And some of it's the wait for the GPS uh, station data um, to, to be able to do that very precise correction. All right, so, um, so at any rate, yeah, less than 24-hour turnaround on those, uh, on those products. 
And that really makes it then accessible for the, the operational world. So this is what some of the data look like. This is uh, purely ASO data, the topography. This is looking at the Lyle and uh, McClure glaciers, uh, the highest point in Yosemite National Park. Um, and the topography comes from the LIDAR, and then the color composite comes from the spectrometer. It's draped on there. You might see the tinge of dust down, down low. This is the broadband albedo, the reflectivity, and, uh, and giving us an idea of how much sunlight is being absorbed and where that tinge of dust was. You can also see that it, the albedo has dropped down to about 50%, 40%. So about 50 to 60% absorption of sunlight. Relative to the cleaner snow, which is up high on the, the, the Lyle Glacier, which has a reflectivity of about 80%, so only an absorption of about 20% of the in, incoming sunlight. All right, that's why glaciers generally form on north-facing slopes. Right? The combination of not much sunlight coming in, and with not much sunlight coming in, then the albedo remains high so that when the sun does come in, uh, it, it still is reflecting that back to space. And then the one that everybody really wants to look at is the, uh, is the snow depth field. And it's remarkable, the spatial variability that we've never known until this project. We've simply interpolated. We thought that we knew that the higher you go, the more snowfall there is. Turns out that's not the case. All right, let's see if these work. Uh, these are paired videos of snow water equivalent and uh, snow albedo across the entire basin. Yeah, okay, they're gonna work. And this is starting last year, March 23rd. There was the peak. And here we go. All right, so, and you know, we, we these kind of look like snow-covered area maps. Um, and I mean, if you squint at them, they are snow-covered area maps. But the absolute volumes in the basin is what's new to all of this on the, on the left side. And then over on the right is the indicator of how, how quickly the snowpack's gonna melt. <clears throat> the nice thing about what's going on with the snow water equivalent is that we can pick any, any sub-basin, we can pick any point in the basin and say, all right, above me here, hydrologically, how much snow water equivalent is there above me? And we can also compare it with how much is coming into the, into the Hetch Hetchy as well as coming past the stream gauges. And that really starts to give us the ability to go back. And this is like a game of whack, whack the mole. Uh, and we're whacking the big snowpack mole. And it's forcing us now to have to understand the soil moisture. So the mission that we have coming uh, online soon that's up in space, the soil moisture active passive, that ultimately is going to have to be key to helping us know the antecedent soil moisture going into the snow accumulation season. Because that controls in the spring what percent of that snowpack you actually get out. All right. so. All right, then we can look at the time series of those total basin snow water equivalents. So 2013 is the blue one. That was our first year. The red is, uh, is 2014. You can see that we actually had, we had peak in early April, which is when you think that peak tends to happen. Now, these are both drought years, and 2014 was one of the three worst years um, on record. And then comparisons with the inflow, as I mentioned uh, um, below. All right, now. Uh, given that a lot of the water down here comes from the Colorado River, uh, I wanted to show these results. This is the Uncompagre River Basin, uh, which flows off the north side of the San Juans, um, ultimately into, uh, into the Colorado River at Grand Junction. And um, this is April uh, 2013. Oh, sorry, that says April 2013, but that's actually May. And these are May uh, as well. And this is just to show the, the incredible dustiness of that mountain snowpack uh, and the incredible snowmelt rates. And all of these data come from, these are not photographs out the plain. This is all coming from the, the Airborne Snow Observatory. What's that? The tan is the dust, yeah. And, and at times when you're skiing on it, out sampling, you have to adjust your brain back to knowing that you're not skiing out in the desert. I mean, it is so phenomenally dirty and does not look like snow. And it also ravages the bases of your, uh, of your skis. 
Okay, so the other thing we've been doing is starting to evaluate what we've thought we've known. And there are, there are models out there, uh, for instance, SNODAS, which is the National Weather Service's best estimate of snow water equivalent across the, uh, the continental U.S. And that's done at one kilometer. And it's never been possible to evaluate these products until ASO. And I'm going to, I'm moving. Um, so, so what we found in 2014, right? It's a, it's a drought year, so this does not necessarily translate to every year that is to come. Um, we'll find out. But what we found is that the errors, the snow water equivalent errors for snow gas, rise with elevation. And in particular, the biggest errors lie where we don't have snow pillows. And so the reason that we think that this is going on is, that, as I mentioned before, there's this perception that as you increase elevation, you get more and more snowfall, right? The so-called lapse rate. And we think that that modeling concept and that concept that <laughs> penetrates all of snow hydrology and meteorology is probably wrong. And so this is, this is really the, appearing to be the first big dis scientific discovery by the Everborn Snow Observatory is that there's this kink in the accumulation of snow in the mountains. And that, for sure, it increases for a while, and then it tends to plateau. Um, and so how this translates around the world, we'll see. All right, so the application. So we're working with uh, not only DWR, uh, but also the City of San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And um, working on the Tuolumne. Uh, they need to get a stream flow, power generation, and of course water supply. That's their, their number one metric. Um, and so the DWR as well as the city of San Francisco are putting together the PRMS models for the entire uh, Sierra Nevada gradually. Uh, and the Tuolumne is the first implementation of this that also works with the Airborne Stone Observatory. And this is how they divide the basin up. So they're not running it at our full one and a half meter resolution. Uh, they, they break it into hydrologic response units. And these are the results. Okay, I'm moving back over. <clears throat> so this is the modeling with, sorry, this isn't my line, this is my line. Um, so, so the PRMS, this is the model without the Airborne Snow Observatory. Right? And this is the inflow observation. Now, the assimilation, so the bringing in of the ASO data happens at this particular timestamp when we got an acquisition. And what happens is the model begins to realize, oh well, I don't have that much snow water <coughs> in the basin, and I know where it is. And so it comes into much better accord with the observations. So we ended up with about a 6% error in that runoff forecasting relative to about a 37% error uh, in, without that information. Okay, so where are we going? So this is, this is present acquisitions for ASO uh, in California. So here's the Tuolumne. We also fly the Merced, the lakes basin here above Mammoth. Uh, we've added Rush Creek, which again I mentioned is Southern California Edison as well. Uh, and then the Kings. And you see all this red and yellow scary looking stuff. And it's scary because it's in mil military airspace. So we only get to fly on weekends because we have a laser and they don't want to shoot us down. Um, well, actually some of them probably would enjoy it. But, uh, so where are we going? This is where we're going. We've, we're working on this plan with DWR to be able to fly the entire Sierra. So you get a high pressure period like today, get a clear shot of the snowpack, we go out, it's probably going to be three aircraft that will go out, and you can see these individual flight lines just mowing back and forth, and we'll have an aircraft that's covering this, an aircraft covering that, and an aircraft covering that. And we'll get that complete snowpack picture. How much total volume is there in the, in the mountain snowpack? And how that goes with, uh, with weekly acquisitions or monthly uh, is still up in the air. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how long does it take to do one of these campaigns in these areas? You said three aircraft. Is that is So this would be about eight hours of flying for each one of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we so so right now it's about three hours for us to fly the Tuolumne. However, we're moving to a uh, a higher altitude with the aircraft, and that will allow us to 
we're, we're going to be able to fly quite, quite quickly relative to what we're flying now, but that also gives us a greater slot. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the plan to be able to, uh, to pick this up. Does that produce coarser data? It produces coarser data, but right now, I mean, we, as I said, right, we could map your head, yeah. right? We don't need to know the snowpack that well. Yeah. Yeah, so we could back off to 10 meter resolution. Right now we're getting it at one and a half meter resolution, right? So about like this. And it's, it's really cool, it's, it's fantastic for the scientists to, to understand. But we can back away to 10 meters quite easily and get the kind of values that, uh, that we're after. 30 meter lens action. 30 meter potentially. The, the, so the, the cutoff for the spatial variability in snow, snow properties is around 30 to 40 meters, as we've understood it. These data are going to allow us to start to understand that. And it's starting to appear that you want to quantify it at a little finer than that. Um, we can have an endless discussion about uh, about Landsat too, because we, we do map with that. So so the Uncompadre is down here. We're at with the Colorado Water Conservation Board. We just uh, we, I think it's done. It was done yesterday. A space act agreement with them to fly the headwaters of the Rio Grande and the Canaos down here. Uh, we also fly the Grand Mesa, uh, which is where um, the Colorado Water Conservation Board and MET work together on methods for. Um, Cloud seeding. Um, and let's see, I'm off the, off the map here. I mentioned this earlier. So we're also working with the uh, state of Wyoming, uh, state engineer's office to fly the Wyoming range, the Wind River range. This is the Green River, and it's, they are horribly void of snow information right here. Colorado Water, or the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. The forecasters for the green uh, oftentimes just talk about rolling the dice. Uh, for their forecasting there, simply because of lack of the information. And then the snowies and the, and the medicine bows down here as well. All right, that's where we are now, but where we want to go, again, in the Colorado River Basin, and I, I spoke to the Upper Colorado River Commission not long ago, we want to go to the whole of the Upper Colorado. And this is going to take, it's really strung out relative to, uh, to the Sierra. So, um, but the fact that California has great interest in the Colorado River means that potentially we can share those three aircraft that are for the Sierra. They get their snapshot, migrate into the, uh, into the upper Colorado, supplemented by a couple of other aircraft, and then we can do the full quantification. And of course, as the, as the snow melt advances, then you need fewer, fewer um, aircraft. All right, I think just this is just pointing to those activities. I've mentioned all of these, the uh, DWR, the California Cooperators, uh, City of San Francisco, Hetch Hetchy Operation, and as well, the flights that we're getting right now are paid for, the wintertime acquisitions are paid for by uh, the San Francisco PUC, uh, Trilock Irrigation District, Metropolitan, or uh, Modesto uh, Irrigation District as well. Um, we're also working on a value of information study with the Bureau of Reclamation Research Office in the Colorado, Colorado Water Conservation for Wyoming, Sierra Nevada Water Authority. Um, and then we're partnering also with the National Water Center, which is, is spinning up in, for some strange reason in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Um, so here's the, here's the final one, and this is just, uh, this is, uh, about a week and a half ago, I guess two weeks ago, uh, the flight over the Tuolumne. This is the spatial distribution of snow water equivalent. It's down here in the bottom pool. It's really grim. Um, so the total, the total volume was 77,000 acre feet, which is about 43% of last year's peak. Now last year again was one of the three worst years on record. Um, and for sure there's, there's still a month before the nominal peak snow water equivalent. However, if you look at the drought forecast uh, out through May, it's quite grim uh, for, for snowfall. Uh, and the next ASO flight is actually today. So if you get a chance, go on flight aware. And the most important thing is just to remember, so remember flightaware.com and then N41J. And you can watch the plane, and it'll take off out of Mammoth and go up, and then it'll just start mowing like at uh, Fenway Park. All right, I'm done, so we can have questions.
as you cough hard. Uh, put you on the spot. Director Barbary from Metropolitan. Metropolitan, the talk about Metropolitan really means the allocation. And one of the big uh, uncertainties is how much to draw down dining well. Okay. Not in, I guess there's some difference of opinion, maybe a little bit this year because they don't know what's going to happen next year. So with your great presentation and understanding and, and maybe some bad input or some uh, troubling uh, projections that you alluded to, mm -hmm. what would be your take on uh, how much net should draw down value value? Not necessarily in fees, but recognizing what your assessment is what the water supply will be. Uh, so, so my, okay, so my, my take on process is they should invest in a genie. Um, a really good one. Um, so, yeah, so, but this lets us know what's there right now. And as one, one of the cooperators put, us, put it to us uh, back in November at the cooperators meeting, essentially, you guys are building new reservoirs by flying this without having to go through, through an EIS, right? I mean, we, it's taking a bunch of the hedging out of the process by being able to quantify the mountain snowpack. That said, we don't know how much snowfall there's, there's going to be, but it does give you baselines on where you actually are right now, as opposed to the great uncertainty in, in where you're at, right? As they, as they say, you can't manage what you don't measure. You can't manage your pocketbook if you don't know how much money you have. And, uh, and, and now we're actually making the full, that full quantification. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while before we actually can go from total volume to knowing exactly how much water is going to be coming out. And what are the sensitivities? How sensitive is it to the soil moisture, the antecedent soil moisture? Uh, how sensitive is it to the last few years of soil moisture? How sensitive is the sublimation? And this gives us access to sublimation like we've never had either. Yes, sir. What you said is true, except, you know, it's like, you know, it's like building new reservoirs. If you could change the storage curves that the core uses on the storage reservoirs below. And what we have to, because right now, there's a, there's a book that says if it's April 1st, you know, the elevation, the elevation of that reservoir has got to be this based on 50 years of data and assuming that the person who's running the gates yeah. had a third grade education. So if you can change the storage curves, you don't dump out all this water, you know, because you know how much water is going to be up in the headwaters, uh, and you can adjust the storage curve based on the moisture that you're seeing yeah. and, and what the weather forecast is. And by, by doing that with existing reservoirs, you can save a whole lot more water without building any more reservoirs. Right, right. Yeah, so on average, they do pretty well, right? But year to year, they don't do so well. And those uncertainties are the ones, that's what we're really trying to chase, chase down is the excursions and and which cost a lot of money and they cost a lot of resource and they affect a lot of people they affect farmers they affect municipal use and right people people live in the in the day to day they don't live in in 30 year calibration periods and so we dumped about 700,000 feet of water to the ocean in January and February of 2013 based on largely on storage curves and if we had this accepted by the core <coughs> and other people, we would have saved, you know, six or seven hundred thousand acre feet of water. We'd be in different shape today than we are. Uh, how how are we doing getting that change in the storage curves? You know, are you any, working with the core and other people? So the core the core is watching this, uh, and one of my one of my projects is with the uh, the Army Corps Cold Regions Lab, 
Um, and we've actually not had specific discussions yet with the core out here, um, but it's, it's a process that we're going through. We're talking with everybody uh, and we're being invited by a lot of people and um, it really, I think, there are only a few of us and fortunately NASA uh, has directed funding to us uh, for a planning year right now heading into a five-year center for snow water and availability and that center is intended to really start to build out the foundation of this to put together more resources and more people for us to be able to talk to the core and keep that relationship going keep that conversation going and seeing what needs to be done to uh, to get the data in a shape that they can feel confident that it's gonna go on for a while and also that it's of the of a, a useful form for them so it's a process that we're working on but having these conversations is really important toward that yes. in your collection of your snow water equivalent uh, two questions uh, using the lidar yeah. you know, california has a lot of control density survey control density for your gps and right how about that colorado basin that's pretty standard yeah, well, so the so the Uncompagre has uh, three snow pillows uh, in it, and but it doesn't have many uh, snow courses. So we the way that we do this is we we model the spatial distribution of snow density, and we constrain it by those measurements. So we make sure that we lock those in, and that's ongoing uh, research for us. Just with intensive surveys, graduate students and postdocs out digging snow pits and, uh, and measuring density. The other part of the question is, how long does it take to uh, uh, digest all that data? It's more than 20 hours in that big flight of uh, California and Colorado. Well, so, so the way that we, you deal with it is by putting together more supercomputing. And uh, and the the nice thing is that it is scalable, so it doesn't it doesn't run exponentially. Uh, you you can throw more CPUs at it and and keep it down below 20 hours. You, I think you were. Uh, <clears throat> what has been PWR's interest in this? I think it's uh, natural for them to take this over as part of their process of evaluating our resources. Yeah. So, so Frank Gerke and I had a conversation about four years ago. Um, where we said, you know, we really should do this. And then he went about making sure that we got the, the funding. So there's been a roughly third of the funding has come from DWR. And, um, and uh, so we're having the conversations with them. We've had conversations with the, uh, the Assembly um, and the Senate and, I mean, presented to all of them. And the discussion is really working in that direction. Oh. The, the idea of the center is really to see that at JPL to see that transition. Uh, respecting the time, I'm, I'm going to just make one comment. One of the challenges is that, as you well know, uh, water resource management in the state or anywhere in the West is highly fragmented. So in what, what the background here is, he's working with a huge number of stakeholders. And finding, for us, from our point of view, we would love for a single stakeholder with money to take responsibility. <laughs> we'll handle this is not we don't want to do to you. I can we submit this is, we are not an operational agency. We want to hand this over at some sort of research. And that's where the, the cooperators idea so the, there's the cooperators program and the and the various entities contribute either their data or funding to DWR to operate that program for the, the snow water equivalent in the Sierra. And and that's one of the things that we're discussing is essentially to go that path. So DWR would facilitate this, uh, this program and, and again we would make the data freely available uh, to the whole world. Because there's that synergy between those observations which are operational and the science. The science has relied on those measurements very heavily and they're critical to then being able to bring the science back to the operations. Rick, final question? Um, yeah, it, it, it was more or less answered, but it seems that with the mutual respect that all these scientists have together at JPL, you know, how are you going to blend, say, the GRACE project with ASO, with all the other things to come to a, a collaborative effort regionally? So we've, uh, we have undertaken this year from our own investment budget to start a three-year project to do exactly that, is to work on an integrated uh, California centric at the outset uh, water information system uh, that ties together many different 
pieces of information and data sources to come up with usable uh, information products. So, uh, well, that's why Jay Ramolietti is at JPR now. Uh, his contributions from Tom, the whole team of hydrologists we have are putting together an integrated system that will provide a point of information across California. So we'll see you in three years. Yeah, and, and those pieces those pieces are all critically intertwined, right? So being able to get at, there's still a, a, an uncertainty in the absolute numbers for the grace, not the relative numbers. The relative numbers are, are good, but the absolute numbers simply because of not knowing exactly how much snow water equivalent there is that's affecting that gravity signal. And so the information that we're providing, in fact, that one that shows that there's there's about a factor of two too much water according to the SNODAS product, which they've been using. So they're starting to correct their retrievals to get more absolute numbers. And then SMAP coming online, it, the whole thing is, is re, this is a beautiful time for starting to know the, the water cycle. What a great presentation.